Lord with us. And if you are a guest here today, if you're visiting, please fill out one of the visitor's cards for us. Uh, It helps us to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, You can share prayer requests with us on there as well. And we hope you come again and, and we invite you to come again. A few announcements that I would like to make. Um, just remember our Wednesday schedule this week is the same, uh, normal Wednesday schedule. So if that uh, is something you normally take a part of, uh, remember that. Uh, if, if it's not something that you've normally taken a part in, uh, we invite you to come and, uh, and have a, a time of fellowship, time of studying God's Word, uh, and your stuff for all ages uh, around here that, on that night. So, um, Also, looking ahead a couple weeks uh, to November 20th is our annual meeting here at Good Shepherd. Uh, I, th- I thought I saw somebody reading a report, so they're probably in your boxes at this point. Um, please, if you're a member, um, make sure to, to be here on that night. The last thing that I'm going to mention uh, is... Uh, the missions board wants me to thank you for your generosity in providing um, things for the bags, for the gallons of care, or for uh, monetary donations. What, how, whatever way you gave, they thank you for that. Their goal was 75 bags, and they got 82 bags. So uh, thank you for that. You can see the, all the work. They, they packed them all yesterday. It's all back there on the counter. They are now starting a new uh, missions focus. Uh, they have, they found some loaves of bread from who knows when in one of the closets. Uh, they're fake. Uh, they have a slit in them for donations. Apparently they were used at a different missions uh, focus in the past. Um, they're going to use these now. This Thanksgiving, uh, the ministry, or the, the monetary donations will be split between outpost ministries and the Hope Centers for Children of Africa. Uh, and there, are, there is a little bit of uh, instructions on the back if you, if you forget what they're for. Um, but put it in your house, somewhere visible, somewhere where you, maybe when you sit down to eat, uh, collect cash, coins, whatever you'd like to put in here. Uh, but bring it back on the Thanksgiving service, uh, which is the, the evening before Thanksgiving. I, I'm not sure of the date right now. Um, but it must, it must be the 27th. Uh, it's in your bulletin, the 27th. There you go. Just look at your bulletin. Bring it back on the evening of the 27th during the service, and we will collect the offering that, this way this year. Uh, and once again, it is being split up between those two ministries. You can find these somewhere out in the entryway. I believe Monica said she would be near them. So find Monica, you find the fake bread. So... That is all I'm going to mention for today. Make sure you take a look at the inserts for your own uh, sake as well in case there's other things that would really apply to use specifically. But let's read the, uh, the psalm for this morning. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love. And with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn number 173 in the blue hymnal.
confession of sin. Let us bow before the Lord and confess our sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we plead for refuge to your infinite mercy, and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of our will, and true obedience to your word. name he gives power to become sons of God and has promised that his Holy Spirit he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this Lord to us all. At this time we'll invite up Mike Berg to read our scripture. Good morning. Our first reading this morning is found in Isaiah, chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Reading in Jesus' name. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of your, our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing the meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and con con convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies your new moon festivals, and your appointed feasts. My soul hates. They, are, they have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red light as crimson, they shall be like wool. And our next reading is found in Luke The 19th chapter, reading verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, 
since Jesus was coming that, that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Here ends the reading. Now please turn in your blue hymnal to page 105 as we confess the Nicene Creed together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll call upon our ushers to receive our tithes and offering. Let's pray first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you give to us, Lord. Help us to be thankful and and grateful for everything that we have, Lord. Even for the air that we breathe, we take all these things for granted. Lord, we pray that you would bless this offering now, Lord, that your will would be done, that many would come to hear of your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
We will be in uh, 2 Thessalonians for the next three weeks as we look at what Paul says to that church there. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 1 through 12 are our verses for this morning. Would you please rise as I read those? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 1 through 12. There we go. Reading in Jesus' name. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as it is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that you would sanctify us in your truth this morning, speaking law and gospel to our hearts and minds. Lord, We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As Paul traveled around to many different churches, I'm sure he often came across messengers from other churches that had news for him. And on this occasion, it seems as though news came for Paul and it it was very well received. It was news of how well the Thessalonians were doing. And so Paul had many reasons to to thank God, to glorify God. One of those reasons we find here in these first few verses that he glorified God for his brothers and sisters. He glorified God for their strong faith. He says, your faith is growing abundantly. Now, one way I think we could think about uh, faith is our connection to God. I'm sure you all are familiar with what this is. It's my cell phone charger. Uh, Sometimes cell phone chargers go bad. Uh, Mine started to go bad. It started to fray there from being bent and all of that. And the connection was a little bit loose and it wasn't getting all the juice that it needed to. My connection was loose. And when previously it had been strong. Well, Paul here... Is talking about faith in this sense, right? It's kind of like this where your faith can be quite loose. The connection isn't quite there. Sometimes your faith can be strong and it's getting all the power it needs. Well, Paul is thankful for the strong faith of these believers in Thessalonica. He's elated. He's joyful. Even though the unbelieving Jews around them were persecuting them, Right? There was great potential, great potential that the Thessalonians could have severed their connection altogether with Christ. And yet, they never wavered. And that's what Paul is thankful for. They were placing themselves in God's hands during persecution. They trusted Him. They knew that God would either end that persecution or help them to bear it. 
And instead of being scared, they were bold in their faith. And they continued, continued all the more to spread the good news about Jesus. That is, His life was lived for them. His death was for them. And that He was raised for them. That Jesus made them new creations by grace through faith. That He has forgiven their sins. Well, Paul was not only thankful and glorifying God for their strong faith, but as we see, as well, for their pure love. Their love was increasing for each other. Well, if if we compare this to our faith, we could say maybe that God's love was flowing through them. It was the power behind their faith. It was like the electricity that comes into your cell phone. These people, these Thessalonians, they could love like Christ because they knew that they were loved by Christ. They were safe even though they were persecuted. And they, the evidence of this was that they loved their fellow brothers and sisters. They helped them. They met their needs. They did not turn on one another so easily. And it's probably pretty evident too that they loved the ones even persecuting them. I imagine they forgave them of that. Looked past those offenses. I imagine some of those people that were persecuting them, they even knew personally. They just kept holding out the promise of Christ to them, hoping that they would turn from hate to love themselves. Every affliction that the Thessalonians endured was a badge of honor for them because it was proof that they were on the side of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us here that there's a righteous judgment of God. This righteous judgment is that they were deemed worthy of the kingdom of God. Back in verse, uh, I think it was verse 3, Paul says, We boast about you. Paul and his uh, uh, associates were boasting about the Thessalonians. They were glorifying God in all the churches they went to. Because these Thessalonians were glorifying God with their lives. Paul was extremely thankful for their example. They were inspiring not only to Paul and his associates, but to all these people and all these churches that he went to. Hopefully they're inspiring to you as well. Because in the midst of suffering, in the midst of persecution, they persevered. In fact, they even thrived. They were probably more effective, more fearless, more tender-hearted than during the time before persecution came. Because persecution has a way of doing that. The fact that Paul is holding them up as a faithful example of Christian faith and love would have been encouraging to them too. To know that Paul was proud of them. See, God knew that They needed all the encouragement that they could receive during this time of persecution. And now the people, the Thessalonians, knew that they were not forgotten. That many other people were lifting them up in prayer. Hopefully, we're doing that regularly. Lifting up our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. Because it's encouraging to them. In fact, I don't know if many of you are get emails from the Voice of the Martyrs right now, but they were encouraging people to send letters of encouragement to the, was it the Christians in Nigeria or something like that? Yeah. Uh, I would encourage you to do stuff like that. To, to lift others up, to build up their faith is a good work of God. It's something He wants us to do. See, Jesus was at work in the midst of the Thessalonians. He was working through them by the Holy Spirit and now it seems as though others were catching that fire of steadfastness and and growing themselves. Now, the temptation would have been to, to see their suffering as a punishment for sin. To see their suffering as evidence that they were unworthy of the kingdom of God. But no, this is why Paul is writing. To tell them that they are worthy of living in eternity with Jesus one day. 
All because of Jesus. Because he was the one who made them worthy. I'm sure they heard Paul tell them from time to time that they should expect persecution. Because Jesus told them that they would not be exempt from it. But they also knew that Jesus was with them during that persecution. He pledged to save them. He promised to purify them and make them his worthy saints. That is, the righteous judgment of God. The question for you today is, what kind of connection do you have to Jesus? Is it a loose connection? Maybe seemingly non-existent at times? Or is it a strong connection because of the Word of God? See, faith is a gift from God. It is not something that you conjure up in yourself. It is a gift of God. And so is God's love. If you want a strong faith like the Thessalonians, you have to rely on God's Word to sustain you for it. You have to be plugged in to Scripture. See, it doesn't come naturally. Naturally is falling away. No, staying strong, staying connected to Christ is only done supernaturally through His Word. It's Jesus who makes you His saint, and He's the one who grows your faith and increases your love. So Paul was thankful for his brothers and sisters in Thessalonica. He was glorifying God for them, but he was also glorifying God for his righteous judgment, as we've already seen once now. Now there's a couple aspects to the judgment of God that we need to always keep in mind. One aspect is that God is just. He's always just in everything that he does. But the other aspect is that he is merciful. He gives relief. And we see that in these next few verses here. God is glorifying, or Paul is glorifying God for his justice because it will be measured out in the future. He says, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. See, one day, sometime in the future, maybe even in the near future, Jesus is coming back. That day, which we sometimes refer to as Judgment Day, will be the day that Jesus puts on his judge robe. And he will come from heaven with his angels, as we're told here in our passage. And I imagine there will be much fear and dread among people in our world because Jesus is coming back in vengeance. He's coming back to pay pay back those according to what he measured out. And for those who are persecuting believers, afflicting believers, God will pay back with affliction. He tells us that this is evidence of their unbelief, the fact that they persecute people. Jesus will hand out verdicts. And he will announce condemnation. And he will carry out the punishment. And that nobody will be able to argue with the fact that it is a perfect, righteous justice being done on earth. Because that is what God does. There's a few different groups, it seems here, as Paul mentions in verse uh, 8, that he is talking about here. He says, Those who do not know Jesus as their Savior... Right? These are the ones who will only know Jesus as their judge. They did not acknowledge him as God. In fact, they suppressed the truth of God's word by their wickedness and by their dark hearts. They worshipped idols and they reveled in their sin. To them, Jesus will come in blazing fire. But this other group here we see as well that he says... There are those who knew God, but they did not obey His Word or His Gospel. They refused to believe that it was by Christ's work alone that they were saved. They insisted on adding something that they did to what Christ had already accomplished for them. 
And in that way, they deny salvation by grace through faith. Essentially, they're rejecting God's grace. Rejecting His mercy and love. Both of these groups of people that Paul talks about here will find themselves in hell. Scripture tells us about hell and how it's an everlasting suffering. It's an unquenchable fire. You might think of it as a never-ending process of destruction. Paul tells us here that it's an absence of God's presence. An absence of God's preserving power as he upholds everything here and now. Perhaps the most terrifying thing is that unbelievers will never see God's glory. Unlike believers who are promised and and awaiting God's glory to be face to face with Jesus. That is only done by acknowledging one's sin. By receiving the mercy of God with thankfulness. Right? This is what Paul says when he says in verse 7, to grant relief to you who are afflicted. This is the mercy of God. This is the other side of the judgment of God. It's the acquittal of those who believed in Jesus. These are the ones who even at this present time are counted righteous in the eyes of God. And as we sung a few minutes ago, it's all because of the blood of Jesus shed for humanity. God's perfect righteous judgment and justice demand that Christians will be counted not guilty of their sins. And that's because Jesus already paid the price for them. When Jesus comes back again, believers, we are told, will meet him in the air. And they will never leave his saving presence from that time onward, forever to be with him. So think about that. If you are a believer today, you will bask in the light of God's glory forever. All saints everywhere for all time will be glorifying Jesus for his just judgment. For establishing justice and peace on earth as well as in eternity. Right, the righteous judgment of God is that we will be counted worthy for the kingdom of God, but the righteous judgment of God is that he, you would be saved. That's his desire for all of us. And so when we read a text like this, any text, especially when it talks about hell, it should stop us, each of us in our tracks and make us examine our hearts and lives. Think about it. Are you living your life on the least level? Just going through the motions of the faith, right? Isaiah in our our text that Mike read earlier is talking about that. Talking about those who just go through the motions. Putting in their time, but not actually living out their faith. Think about it. Is the kingdom of God way down on your list of priorities? If so, repent. Repent. God doesn't want vain sacrifices and prayers, he tells us. He wants you. He wants all of you. And anything less than that is an abomination, a burden that wearies God, and he says he hates it. God will not listen to you while you remain in your filthy rags with crimson stains, but he wants to and he invites you to finally come to him in faith. To glorify Jesus with your repentance and faith. And then he promises, like he promises at the end of our text in Isaiah today, that you will be made white, clean like wool. Paul glorifies God for his brothers and sisters and for God's righteous judgment. Paul also glorifies God, and this should seem obvious, glorifies God for his son Jesus. And for his word. For the testimony of God's word that has come. Paul writes, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints. 
See, Jesus is the head. And Jesus came to redeem His body, the church. And there's a sense that without His body in heaven, He would be incomplete. Think about Adam without Eve. That's not right. It's not good. And so Jesus comes again to receive us to Himself. To complete His plan of salvation, Jesus comes in power. He comes raising the dead. That's both believers and unbelievers alike. And we're told that we will marvel at our Lord, completely astounded at what He has done for us. I don't think we can even attempt, uh, begin to imagine what that will be like. Once again, all of this was made possible by God's Word, by Jesus. God came and testified to us that He loved us and that He would provide for us a Savior. And that person would be His Son, Jesus. And God's Word that you often, hopefully, often hold in your hands God's Word is what led you to Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit working through that Word that gave you faith to cling to. It's God's Word that brings you to your knees in repentance when you sin. Without God's Word, I think it's probably pretty clear where we all would be. Without God's testimony to us, no one would have hope for an eternity with with Him. No one, absolutely no one, would have hope for salvation. So we must, with Paul, be thankful for Jesus and for His Word. But also be thankful and grateful and glorify God for the working of faith within us. He says, Paul says, our testimony to you was believed. The apostles and, and Paul were tremendously instrumental in bringing about God's Word, this testimony to the churches around, to the Thessalonians. And this testimony that hopefully we are repeating, this confession is that God is in control even during times of persecution. It's a testimony that says be ready for Jesus to return at any time. It's a testimony that encourages people to repent because the kingdom of God is near. And as we see, as as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, it's a testimony full of encouragement and love for others' faith, too. The righteous judgment of God is, in fact, that we will be glorified with Jesus. Paul writes, So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and you in Him. Like Paul and, and the other apostles, we must Pray for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. We must pray that we will stay steadfast in the faith no matter what comes. Whether that's persecution or trials of all sorts. Just think about it for a moment. Think about one day you're sitting at your kitchen table and persecution comes to your door. What are you going to do? Will you quickly abandon Jesus? Will you deny Him as your Savior to, in order to save your physical life? Or will you accept it as a, as a gift from God? An opportunity to speak for Him, to confess Him before the world, to tell people what life is really all about. See, Jesus promised that persecution will come. But he also promised that he's going to come. And that's what we can rest our hopes on. One day, Christians, you may be given a chance to glorify the name of Jesus in the midst of persecution. Just like Paul and the apostles did. Just like many others through the centuries have done. Just like many of our brothers and sisters today are doing. As his saints, we truly will be made holy perfectly when he comes again. Perfectly blameless, just like Jesus. We will be glorified when we become like he is. 
Isn't God good? He, he shares even that with us. Fully and finally transformed, we will live our lives in heaven, constantly glorifying our Savior Jesus for His love and mercy and grace. And as we await that day of praising and honoring and glorifying our Savior, let us not neglect to do so even now. To thank Him with our lives each and every day. To look forward to that day when we will have the honor of listening to Jesus confess us before his Father. Can you imagine what that will sound like? It will be the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus. For giving us a Savior that loves us. For giving us a shepherd who leads us with his word. Lord, we glorify you with our praise and our gifts and our talents and our money and everything that we have, Lord. We want to belong to you fully. Not just on Sundays or Wednesdays or whatever. Lord, help us to be fully committed to you. Lord, that we might share with other people this message. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we have the privilege of communion with Jesus and with each other in the Lord's Supper. So, dear friends in Christ, in order that you may receive this holy sacrament in a worthy manner, you should carefully consider what you must now believe and do. From the words of Christ, this is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. You should believe that Jesus Christ is present with his body and blood as the words declare. From Christ's words for the forgiveness of sins, you should also believe that Jesus gives to you his body and blood to strengthen your assurance that your sins are forgiven. And finally, you should do as Christ commands you when he says, Take, eat, drink of it, all of you. This do in remembrance of me. If you believe these words of Christ and do as he has commanded, then you have properly examined yourselves and may eat Christ's body and drink his blood in a worthy manner. You should also unite in giving thanks to Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for so great a gift. And should love one another with a pure heart. And thus, with the whole Christian church, have comfort and joy in Christ our Lord. To this end, may God the Father give you his grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, and when he had eaten and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Today we have this privilege of worshiping Jesus, of receiving communion together. We would ask that all adult, uh, we would invite all adults and confirmed youth who are trusting in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and who have been honest with God, living in repentance and faith, believing that Jesus truly is present uh, with the elements today. 
His body and blood are truly present as he declares. We invite you forward and we invite the ushers at this time as well.
Please stand for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.